Now, if I was to ask you what bad sex was, what it looked like, sounded like, felt like, chances are, I think, that you might come up with quite a range of different answers. There's no adage that says one person's good sex is another person's bad, but maybe there should be. But if I was to ask you what a bad sex scene looked like, I think you might come up with some quite similar answers. We might talk, if we're thinking about literature, about clunky metaphors or awkwardly mismatched characters or cliches or kind of euphemisms for sex that just feel awkward or embarrassing or bad somehow. A bad sex scene in literature, you might say, could look something like this. Like a furious matador, <laughs> he thrust his throbbing member into her desperate yearning flower. Oh God, she cried. She was a locked door begging to be opened. And he was the locksmith of her dreams. Now this is pretty bad, right? <laughs> right. I can promise you with almost total certainty that the author of this passage won't be offended if you think so. Uh, because it was me. <laughs> and if you permit me a moment of just a uh, very brief, I promise, literary analysis, this bad sex scene's got it all. So it's got the slightly weird uh, opening simile, so like a furious matador. It's got the inevitable but awful genital, genital euphemisms. So he has a throbbing member and she has a desperate yearning flower. It has the inevitable exclamation of female pleasure that has to always greet the throbbing member. <laughs> and finally, as if all of that wasn't enough, it ends on a seriously clunky metaphor. She is a locked door begging to be opened. He is the locksmith of her dreams. Now, as a lecturer um, in English literature, I do a lot of research on sex and shame, which means that I have to read loads of dirty books, <laughs> and it means that I have to watch loads of truly filthy films, which, you know, isn't the worst job in the world. There are worse. But I like to make my job that little bit more uncomfortable by deliberately seeking out the sex scenes that make me personally feel as embarrassed and awkward as possible. And those are the sex scenes that I write about. Now, I think it's quite easy, if you want to, to avoid bad sex scenes, maybe more so than avoiding bad sex. <laughs> For example, I can think of one case, at least, where the Christmas Day gift giving of a copy of Fifty Shades of Grey wasn't exactly received with the glee that was perhaps anticipated. But what I'd like to suggest in my talk today is that we become much more curious about the embarrassment and awkwardness that we uh, feel when we experience bad sex scenes. I think bad sex scenes have a lot to teach us about the world that we live in. Now, in and of itself, that's not exactly a revolutionary idea. That notorious bedroom curtain twitcher, Freud, had a lot to teach us about the way that our desires shape culture and how uh, culture shapes our desires in return. And we know to take a more contemporary example that the sustained consumption of hardcore pornography not only changes our attitude, attitudes to sex, but the way we actually go on to have it. So just as we shape culture then, we're shaped by it in return. So let's talk about bad sex scenes, why they make us feel awkward, and what we can learn from those feelings of kind of cringiness and embarrassment when we watch or read them. OK, so the first thing to think about when we're thinking about shame and embarrassment in particular is the way that those feelings are actually related to feelings of interest and enjoyment, which might at first seem quite counterintuitive. It might seem to you that feelings of shame and embarrassment are actually the opposite to feelings of interest 
and absorption and enjoyment and pleasure. But what I want to suggest to you today is that for there to exist the possibility that we are turned off by something, there also has to exist the possibility that we can be turned on by it. Now, a mid 20th century American psychologist called Sylvan Tompkins came up with some really useful ideas about how to think about this relationship between pleasure and enjoyment on one hand and shame and embarrassment on the other. And what he said about shame is that it happens only when we've had some kind of prior interest in a thing or a person. So what he said about shame then is that shame operates ordinarily only after interest or enjoyment has been activated and inhibits one or the other or both. So for shame to happen, there has to have been some interest. And furthermore, he discovered in his work that shame also only happens when you've been unable to completely cut off your interest in the thing that's now causing you shame. And to illustrate that, he used a set of really interesting examples of the experience of seeing a stranger on the street. So Tompkins says that shame happens in these circumstances then. Firstly, you're looked at by a stranger. I think we can all relate to that. If we're looked at by a stranger, it can make us feel a bit awkward, self-conscious, embarrassed. Or you're interested in looking at someone, but suddenly can't because they're strange. Or you expect someone to be familiar, but they turn out to be unfamiliar. And I think what he's talking about here is the experience of thinking that you know someone and then them taking you by surprise. Or, and this uh, last example I think will um, speak to anyone who's incredibly short-sighted like I am, you start to smile at someone in the street, hello, then realize they're a stranger. So all of these examples, he says, um, cause us shame, but they're all examples that are to do with having some kind of interest in something that's then cut off, causing us shame. Shame throws us back then suddenly, self-consciously on ourselves. Our interest has been severed. We might feel when we're ashamed, like we have something on our face that everybody can see except us. So that's a little bit of background about how shame and embarrassment are related to interest and pleasure. But what does this mean for thinking about literature and for thinking about bad sex scenes in particular? Well, to start to answer that question, I want to take us back in time a little bit to the 1920s, to the publication of these two books. So uh, D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover and James Joyce's Ulysses. Now, both of these books were banned almost as soon as they were published on account of containing what was judged to be sexually obscene material. Ulysses famously features an account of a man masturbating on a beach whilst he looks at a woman who is an avid reader of romance novels, slowly lifting her skirts. And Lady Chatterley's Lover features an account of an affair across class lines and also features a really detailed anal sex scene. So when these books were published and then when they were subsequently banned, Censors called them slimy and disgusting and immoral and evil. And there was particularly an anxiety about the possibility that women might read these books. It being felt at the time, although I still think this belief persists to some extent, that women were likely to be more sexually corrupted by reading literature, I'm seeing some knowing smiles in the audience there, than men were. In other words, that a woman would read Ulysses one day and then the next day go out to a beach and hoik her skirts up. That was the belief. <laughs> so both of these books then hit a uh, kind of raw cultural nerve when it came to sex. Ulysses was mocking the very thing that ultimately got it banned, the idea that 
um, women reading literature was going to make them sexually corrupt somehow. And Lady Chatterley's Lover was kind of a triple hitter. Not only did it feature an affair across class lines, the belief being in English society at that time that the only way that that society was going to cohere was if people didn't move across class lines. It also featured a really detailed account of female sexual desire. And it brought with it the suggestion that World War I had somehow rendered the elite classes impotent. So these were both books then that made uh, judges very nervous. And in return, they labelled these books as bad. And that's another way of thinking about the word bad in my title today, that bad sex scenes are not just sex scenes that have been deemed to be poorly written somehow, like our um, stunning passage from the beginning of my talk. But they're also sex scenes that have been viewed to be somehow morally objectionable, sex scenes that are going to turn readers rotten. Here's the catch, though. In order to decide that a book is dirty, you have to have a dirty mind. And I think this is something that the judges who banned these books were trying to draw a kind of pure, righteous looking veil over. And that's another thing that shame allows us to do. If we call something shameful, we get to kind of hold it at a distance from us and pretend we're not personally implicated by it. The judges who banned these books then were afraid that they were going to kind of um, bring into being a society where, for example, people had anonymous sex or had affairs or enjoyed taboo kinds of sex without realising that the fact that these books had been written was proof of the fact that that society was already in place. OK, so today we view these books as modern day classics. And they provide us with really interesting windows onto the times that they were written in. And sure, yeah, particularly for me, Lady, Lady Chatterley's Lover contains scenes that feel kind of cringy. But what I'd like to suggest is that we interrogate and become curious about that feeling for what it can teach us about what we want and don't want from sex and about the world that we live in more generally. Okay, so to bring it forward um, to the contemporary then, we don't really ban books in the West so much anymore, although it still happens. But what we have are other kinds of disciplinary mechanisms for pushing away the bad sex and the bad sex scenes that we don't want to encounter. And one of these happens every year in London amongst the literary elite, and that is the uh, so named Bad Sex in Fiction Award. So every year, the Bad Sex in Fiction Award judges read all the literary fiction from that year and pull out the uh, novels that they believe have most crossed the lines of good taste when it comes to their depiction of sex. And the novelist who they feel has written the, the worst sex scene gets the dubious honour of receiving the Bad Sex in Fiction Award. Now, it goes without saying that no novelist wants to receive this award, just as no one presumably wants to be told that they're bad in bed. And hardly ever any novelist ever turns up to collect their prize. <laughs> Because the Bad Sex in Fiction Award is kind of like a modern day stocks that has almost started to work to shame authors of literary fiction out of even trying to write about sex in their books for fear that they might receive one of these awards. The Bad Sex in Fiction Award, in other words, feeds on shame. And we have other ways of shaming or pushing away the sex scenes that we don't want to think about in contemporary society. And another one of those ways is mocking people who read erotic fiction, which I think you can see a lot with the kind of cultural snobbery that greeted the publication of Fifty Shades of Grey. Now, I had um, a high school English teacher who, when my friends and I were reading books like Fifty Shades of Grey as teenagers, used to tell us in a very haughty, uh, grammar school teacher sort of voice. These books, girls, are like drinking dirty milk. 
That's how she would say it. Um, and I think the implication there was that by reading these books, we were somehow turning ourselves into dirty girls. So she was trying to censor our reading in a way that I think um, there's a certain kind of censorship today around contemporary erotica. So maybe we haven't moved on so far then since the days of Ulysses and Lady Chatterley's lover. But what I'd like to suggest is this. Next time we feel embarrassed about a bad sex scene, we want to hold the sofa cushion over our face or slam the book shut. How about we become a bit more curious about that feeling, about what it can tell us, not only about our hopes and desires for sex, but about the way that we move through the world. It could be then that bad sex scenes are kinds of invitation in disguise to come back to our uh, prize winning passage from the beginning of the talk. Bad sex scenes could be like locked doors begging to be opened which might just make us the locksmiths of their dreams. Thank you. <laughs>